trickling in. Well, I'm going to get us started just with introductions so we can. Uh, my name is Chris Morgan. I'm the adult programming librarian at the Newburgh Free Library. And we are so excited to be hosting this small business boot camp uh, put together by the city of Newburgh and the Small Business uh, Administration and taught by uh, Miriam from the Small Business Development Center. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. This really is a really, this is our second course and it's really such a wonderful uh, offering and we're so excited to be par uh, partnering on it. Um, so we can get started, I'm gonna introduce Ellen with the city of Newburgh. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Ellen Fillo. I'm director of community development with the city of Newburgh. I'd like to start off by thanking again our, our host, uh, Newburgh Free Library, our partner, uh, SBA, Small Business Administration, through our co-sponsorship agreement, and the Small Business Development Center uh, for this wonderful uh, small business boot camp. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone each week. And uh, we really appreciate some of the feedback that you've been providing as far as what you'd like to see even going, going further. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Miss Liz from SBA, uh, who will also say a few words. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Abreu. I want to thank Chris and Ellen for inviting the U.S. Small Business Station. Um, I'm an economic development specialist. And the Small Business Administration is a federal agency. And I like to break it down with three C's. And this is what we majorly do. We want to help people to start and grow their business with the three C. First C, counseling. We have a great uh, resource partner. We have a Women Business Center. We have SCORE. And like today, tonight, the Small Business Development Center is going to present. These are three organizations that can help you to start and grow your, your business from the beginning stage to the ending stage, okay? I know they have the one-on-one -on -one counseling for free. I know nowadays everything is virtual. They are still doing that one-on-one -on -one counseling for free, right, Miriam? Because I love free and anything free is good. So besides helping run your business plan, marketing plans, you might have a lot of ideas. Sometimes you have to put it in a business plan and you need help. So the resource partners are there to help you for that. They're not gonna write you the business plan. They're gonna give you homework. You're gonna have a relationship with them. Anything goes wrong, you're gonna go back to your business counselor. So I like to say, listen, take this free counseling and take advantage of this because you're gonna start your business and you're gonna have a lot of questions. The first thing I tell everyone, if you're gonna start your business, the one thing you're gonna need that costs 99 cents, it's a notebook. Okay, because you're gonna have questions. And anytime you speak to the business counselor, and I get it because I'm 50 plus, I'm always having senior moments. Okay, you're gonna forget. You have a notebook, you write down the question. Every time you see your business counselor or you call them, oh, this is my question. Because if you don't write things down, you're not gonna remember. And every time you're gonna say, oh, I gotta go back to my business counselor. Or well, invest 99 cents on the notebook. Write questions down. And once you get the answer, do your homework. So that was my first C. The second C with the Small Business Administration is capital. SBA is not in the banking business. All loans are guaranteed to the major lender of banks, okay? Um, we do have direct loans disaster right now. We're having a disaster with COVID-19. We do have the 3P, the Paycheck Program, I'm sorry, Paycheck Protection Program, 3Ps that we're doing with the banks. We also have the IDLE loan, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, okay? What I love about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan is low interest, okay? For a profit, the interest is 3.4, Well, for a non-profit is 2.3. Okay, we have a lot of information on the SBA disaster website. I know um, Ellen has my information. Is any, oh, even today, does anyone have any question regarding a guarantee loan program or disaster? Feel free, so, um, Elaine, you could give me my number. You have my number, my email, my information. My job is, is to help the small business, even if you're starting or you're growing or you're in a disaster. The last C, and I promise, uh, Miriam, you'll be next, is government contract. A lot of times, the federal government buys so much. We need to get certified, 
okay? You never know what is the government is behind your product or your service, but get certified is the best thing. Not only by the federal, you could also do the city and the state. I'm going to leave this like this. Um, Miriam, I'm going to turn it over to you because I want to hear this great presentation you're going to do today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so for those who were here last week, um, the last session, um, there's a little bit of repetition here, but for, uh, for those who missed it, um, this is a partnership presentation. We have the Mid-Hudson Small Business Development Center is um, where I work, um, is offering the session. And we are sponsored by the SBA, which is a Small Business Administration. And um, this session is also organized by the city of Newburgh and the Newburgh Free Library. So um, you have basically a great partnership here of resources uh, for locals and, and others um, nationwide. So it's a really great um, partnership. So the Small Business Development Center is funded, as I was saying, from the SBA. And what happens is it's a nationwide program. So we're able, as a result of these funds, to offer no cost, one-on-one -on -one business counseling for new or existing businesses. So this is the website for um, New York and it's filled with information and other webinars that you can attend. And, um, and also you can ask for a meeting with an advisor with filling out the application online. Um, we also receive uh, some state funds and New York is different from other state because we have a couple of things that are unique to us. One is we have business librarians that can do research for our clients in any shape, fashion, form. Like I have a, I have um, a new client who's offering OSHA training. So he's new to the area. So he wanted to know who are the construction companies with you know, five to 20 employees, 25 and above. Um, he asked for all kinds of data like this. And I've sent this to our librarians and then a week or two, I'll get a bunch of uh, digital folders with all kinds of information for him. And then I just email it to him. Um, no cost to him. Another thing we have that's unique to our um, state is we have uh, for procurement, which is doing business with the government, a database that we can put our clients with their industry codes in it. And then um, keywords and given their industry, they can re start receiving bid requests for anything from local, um, you know, city, um, or, or, or county to state to federal. So that's also a service, no cost to our clients. Um, so I'm one of uh, half a dozen counselors at the Mid-Hudson. We cover all the six counties and uh, one of the prerequisites for being an, an advisor is to have owned businesses. And um, I have, you know, started close to 10 businesses in my lifetime. I have an MBA and I've been an advisor for about 20 years. And that's just me and multiply this by another, uh, we have another seven advisors that just tells you the wealth of, um, of knowledge and experience that we have in addition to be able to pool with the other 200 advisors statewide. We have an internal email that, you know, we send questions to and and our other advisor fellows, you know, help us when we don't know the answer. So it's an incredibly, uh, it's, it's an incredible amount of uh, information that we can help you with. So we did this program with four sessions. We did um, that one on how to start a business. And today is the new business trends in the pandemic era. And the next two sessions will be, um, one is how to do a feasibility analysis or, you know, doing projections. Um, it's going to be singly just that. Uh, you should have a computer because it will otherwise be too small on your phone to look at. And, and if you call in, you won't be able to understand what's going on. So best to have a computer if you can. Um, and the last session will be about marketing and sales, which is also super important, regardless of what type of, you know, of business you're looking to start. So today's, um, today's topic, I wanted to, talk about new business trends in right now because um, 
if you're starting a business, it's really important to understand you cannot do business. Um, it's not business as usual. This, this is this is very different from even a year ago, and it will continue for probably a while. Um, another year for sure with the restrictions that we have, and um, and then there might be some um, shifts in consumer spending and 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 purchasing behaviors that will be so ingrained that um, it just won't change, even if we go back to, you know, the, the old normal. Not even we're the new normal, but <laughs> we'll go back to the old normal. Um, so it's important to understand these trends so that when you're thinking about starting a business, you can look at your idea and look at the reality of these trends and go, mm, am I in line here or am I in the old model? So, um, there, I'm going to talk about different types of trends and then how they relate to each other and how they relate to the pandemic. And then we'll talk about some creative success stories, um, you know, entrepreneurs that pivoted and so on and so forth. So that's this today's schedule. So mega trends are really uh, the long term, basically development, right? Um, it can affect the economy, science, culture or politics. So these trends are usually stable. Um, they last a few years or even a decade. So um, in this situation, you know, the health related, you know, shock that we had to deal with um, really drove innovation. Um, companies had to think outside the box if they wanted to become relevant. So they also, um, it's also impacted us as consumers, um, how we purchase things, how we how we shop, uh, how we spend our money. So um, that's mega. Then um, we have consumer trends, right? So they are the values that um, basically consumers use to to do the decision making of where they put their money. So. Um, so an, an example would be um, there is now a trend towards sustainability, uh, especially toward you know for Gen X, Gen X and uh, millennials, particularly millennials, they want to make sure that if they spend money with a company, that that company has um, is in line with their values. So um, they will want to make sure that um, there's no you know child labor or that they're paying fair labor wages or that um, they're taking care of the environment or their co community. So they're, they might um, investigate a little further than just buying the pair of socks, for example. They'll want to make sure that there's more to it. And then we have market trends, right? So basically, um, so it relates to the capabilities. And by that, we mean, um, so what, you know, for instance, for example, in this situation, right, um, being that things have changed and an organization had to rethink how they, how they serve and, and how they, they connect with their customers, um, it had, you know, they had to adapt in order, in order for their, you know, within their capabilities um, to respond to the market trends. So, um, and you know, and obviously the market pushes uh, innovation and opportunities uh, if if the companies respond to them. And then we have technology trends, right? So um, obviously, with this crisis, um, I, you know, I, I just can't imagine what this would have looked like in 1980, like before the internet, before cell phones. I mean, it would have just, forget it, it would have been terrible. So at least now, um, a lot of companies uh, and, and a lot of work situation like our work, we know where we're sent virtual and because of technology, I basically went from one day in the office to one day in my home office and didn't see much of a difference really in my work, um, thanks to technology. So the emergence of new technologies and the, and, and the opportunities that they bring, um, helps us with, you know, keeping the economy running and the society running when there's, you know, epidemic. 
So these are big, the big trends. And then um, let's see how they relate to each other. Okay. So um, we have um, the mega trends. They basically um, push the consumer trends and the consumer trends they cause the market trends. So basically as consumers are making different um, decisions based on their values, they are pushing the market to uh, respond to that. So it could be sustainability, it could be uh, social responsibility, it could be equity, um, racial equity or, or financial equity. Um, there are a lot of um, values that consumers find important that can um, disrupt or influence the market. And then the market has its needs and that triggers uh, new technologies. So in a little bit, we'll talk about, um, you know, e-commerce and, 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 and payment options, but and that all, all these things were triggered by the market. So, and then it, it's almost a loop where, you know, the technology will be born out of consumer demand. Sometimes there's a push technology like, you know, cell phones, the smart cell phones. Um, did we did, did we even know we needed smart cell phones? I don't think anyone could have predicted we wanted or needed smart cell phones. So they were, these were technologies were pushed on us, but definitely because um, there was this emergence in technology, then all these apps you know, were created because the consumers wanted them. Um, if you don't, if you're a bank right now and you don't have an app, I don't even know if you're a real bank. So consumers demand that everything is accessible on their phone now. So that drives technology innovation. So now we have um, trends as they relate to the pandemic. And, and I want to put a footnote here. So in the last session, you had as a homework to think about what type of business you wanted to start if you didn't have uh, a clear vision of where you wanted to go with your idea. Uh, this, the, the idea here is for you to take that, this, you know, business idea and look at it as it relates to the changes you might need to make in your model. And we'll have time um, towards the end of this session to talk about it as a, as a group. You can ask your questions either, you know, with the phone or, um, I mean, with your, you know, you can unmute yourself or you can ask the questions in the chat and we'll, we'll, re we'll respond to those. So, um, so um, coming back to this topic. So now these, there are um, different trends that relate to having to deal with a pandemic. No one um, could have, you know, predicted that this would have happened in 2020 in the sense of, you know, in their business plan, they made like a contingency for a pandemic. I don't know anyone who have done that. There might be big companies that have done, you know, this sort of contingency, but the little guy has not. So there's a lot of disruption, disruptive regulations that, um, uh, you know, the closings were huge. Um, big impact on small businesses, particularly, and um, and now with the PPE and, and and all the masks and the cleaning that go with it, um, they're usually short term, but they're definitely disruptive. And um, what we learned also was that um, there were. A lot of supply chain interruptions. Um, stores were having a hard time getting certain goods. Um, certain goods were made in China. We're not getting to us because all the ports were um, in, 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 in a holding pattern. Um, we had a shortage of masks, a shortage of, of all kinds of things that we needed to help those who were being ill. So there, there is now, um, actually this week, the president signed an executive um, order to make sure that a lot of these essential items are made in the USA. So if we're ever you know, dealing with something as dramatic as this again, 
we will have the resources to take care of ourselves. So there's a big drive to localization. Um, I know that last summer, a lot of folks um, decided to participate and become members of their community sustainable supported community supported agriculture, CSAs. You know, these are little farmers that usually sell their shares to locals and then every week you go pick up your share. Well, there was an incredible demand for CSA membership because folks wanted to go to the farmer rather than going to the supermarket. They wanted to go to the farmer they knew that um, would be taking, you know, precautions. Um, whereas, you know, the vegetables they were getting at the supermarket had touched so many hands and got through so many different um, transitions that they didn't feel as safe doing that. So localization comes in all kinds of um, flavors, but there's definitely a trend towards localization. So presence free living means I'm there, but I'm not there. Like I'm working in the office, but I'm not in the office. So my virtual presence means that I can be um, anywhere. You know, I can make appointments um, with anybody in within within our geographic area, but you know, I can make appointments like in within within minutes sometimes. That kind of flexibility was um, not as prevalent prior to this. Um, we were doing a lot of in-person meetings, and that required you know for people to figure out if they could even come and travel to our office and figuring out which office they go to. Whereas now it's like, do you want to meet tomorrow? We'll do a Zoom. And they're like, yes, you know, it's great. So there's a big, um, this fluidity in the presence um, allows for, allows for a, um, a, a, a very quick movement in, um, in business activities. So there, another trend obviously is the fact that we now have our social interactions are extremely digital. Um, I don't know about you, but I've never done so many video calls with friends, family, um, business. I mean, I feel like <laughs> my life is on video call. And like everyone, you know, everyone gets a little burned out, but it does allow us to continue our social interactions. And um, I have an elderly parent that can't visit because she lives in Canada. And we put um, a, a, a system so that she she's not really able to, you know, deal with technology, but this system is made in such a way that it's for the elderly. And um, it basically just, open, when I call, it just opens up and the camera opens up and then we can, video chat and that really literally changed her life. Um, she was extremely isolated and now we're doing video chats, you know, at every meal I call her and, and my sibs call her and through video. And it has really created, um, it's a trend we won't stop even when I can, well, even when I can go visit her. Um, we're gonna keep this, you know, digital life. Um, we're gonna continue. So, um, so there are other trends also as they relate to the pandemic. And one is that folks are willing to give up a little bit of, of, of privacy to feel safer. So for example, um, New York State has an app that you can put on your phone that will alert you if you've been in contact with somebody that tested positive. So they'll, they'll connect the dots. Um, it doesn't know anything other than phone numbers of folks who test positive. It won't tell you, you know, their, their name. It will just say you were in touch um, with an individual on this day at this hour because they saw the phones were together um, and that individual tested positive today. So then it's up to you to get tested if you want, but at least you get an alert. So a lot of folks are like, oh, my privacy is being invaded, but others are like, are like, well, not really, because all they know is that you've been next to this phone. They don't know anything else. But it's for some people, uh, safety is a bigger, um, they're, you know, they're willing to share more information for their safety and, and give up a little bit of their privacy. There's also um, a, a trend towards community. So by that, what we mean is um, the, a lot of companies like, you know, the 
want to support um, a lot of a lot, a lot of locals want to support their local businesses, knowing that if they don't, when all this is over, there won't be those local businesses. So they're shopping local, um, and they're you know they're basically trying to eat out without eating out. They 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 take out at their favorite restaurants in the hope that these restaurants will still be there when everything is said and done. Um, so that kind of community power. Uh, influences, um, you know, is, is a real drive for local economies. And, you know, it's it's also when a brand becomes an active part of a community, um, it, you know, because a lot of companies have invested in their community, they have either fed people or done fundraisers or, you know, all kinds of things have happened. I'll, I'll explain a little later, other examples. Um, when they do it, it's marketing, you know, when we go back to normal, it'll be marketing. And then um, because folks were pushed to live and work in their homes, um, there has been an incredible amount of, um, of trends as it relates to what they call now the great indoors. It can be anything from apps that allow you to figure out what type of plants you can put in your home that will um, you know, th you know, thrive and depending on which type of light you have and um, to um, folks who bought a, who moved out of, of a city to have more room and have um, a, a space to work. Uh, that really um, drew an incredible amount of furniture purchasing. Um, there is a local company here that um, does furniture from it's sustainable it's sustainable um, woodworking they basically if you have a dead tree in your backyard they'll they'll that you need to cut they'll cut it they'll um, you know get the wood ready to plant it and they'll dry it in a kernel and then they can make furniture with your tree um, that will be customized to your needs and handmade and all that. And their business is booming. They've never seen any, anything like this because people are investing in, in their homes or in their day-to-day -day, uh, space. And, you know, it's also folks with kids um, that can afford it um, decided they'd rather live in a house than in an apartment that drove the market in, in everywhere, really. Um, and in new, also in new homes that would have enough space for a home office and whatnot. So um, there are general market trends now, not, not related to pandemic or anything like that. Um, there is a big push towards social responsibility. And what that means is that um, they, they call it, um, it's, it's not only just, it's just not only profit, but it's it's people. You take care of your people, you pay them well, you take care of your community, um, you take care of your planet. So it's basically environmental um, concerns. So depending on where you source your goods or what you do with your, um, uh, you know, after production leftovers, um, they just, you just wanna make sure that you just don't focus Social responsibility is basically not just focusing on profit. And by doing that, you're basically attracting those whose values also include, um, you know, whatever, it could be the environment, it could be a social cause. So there are so many ways to develop social responsibility. If you Google it, you'll see. And to give you an example, there was a company that started guess what, March, 2020. This company was manufacturing high-end um, bags, you know, th those, those fancy bags, and that really catering to those who um, live in cities and who don't mind spending, you know, $300 on a handbag. Well, what happened in March, 2020 is that nobody, um, everybody started working from home. And there was really, you know, basically no need for that um, market. So what she did is that she 
she had to pivot, right? She had to change the model and the way she, because she had all this inventory sitting, she said, I can't sit on this, it has to move, right? Um, she would donate a bag to a person in need every time you purchased a bag online. And um, it was covered in a couple of magazines that talk about fashion. And all of a sudden she was getting all these orders and all of these, um, you know, these are handbags for women. So all these women who would normally never afford any of these bags were able to get a really nice bag that they will use when, <laughs> when everything is said and done. But driving um, this, you know, basically a need like a pair of socks. My daughter will only bear, buy, buy socks by this one company that if you buy a pair of socks, they donate a pair of socks to a homeless person. And um, yeah, you pay a little bit more for your pair of socks, but marginally, and you know that it's going for a good cause. So you're not just buying a pair of socks. So social responsibility is anything you can come up with that will benefit people, planet, uh, purpose. And, um, you know, I, I like to look at the, the multiple, they used, it used to be the triple P's. Now it's the multiple P's. It's a people, planet, profit, and purpose and place. And there's so many um, definitions, but definitely um, an, an important trend. So now it's really super important to be uh, swift to make changes um, and not just with technology it can be internal like a lot of companies were able to uh, allow flexible schedules so that uh, their employees could take care of their family and the homeschooling and everything else but still work um, it, it's, 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 it's a little bit of a double-edged sword for a lot of folks because that, that means they never stop. They're going from one duty to the other, but it allows them to keep their job. So um, these companies, by creating this, you know, innovative way of working, which would have not happened without the pandemic, um, allows them to keep their employees, which is a real, you know, a human human resources are really uh, valuable, and. Um, it, it makes keeps them productive. So they keep their employees, their employees can work and make keeps them productive, keeps them competitive. Um, so it's really important for companies to be nimble. Um, and of course, using technology is important, but it's more important to look at how you can um, change things internally and be swift by, by doing so. Right now it's survival of the fittest. If you're not able to modify the way you do business um, or conduct business or market your goods and services, it's going to be really hard. So survival of the fittest means you gotta be creative. Obviously there was a huge e-commerce push. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never um, ordered so much online um, and I'm not the only one and I'm not a big buyer. I just you know, just don't want to go to stores right now because it's, you know, um, a risk to my family. So basically, um, those who are not able to embrace that will not be around. I have a client who's really hurting. I've been really encouraging um, this restaurant slash deli to go and have an online presence so that people can order online as opposed to call in and um old school he says i want to talk to my clients uh which is fine but he could do both if he wanted to he could say you can call in or you can order here and there are a lot of folks who don't want to call in they just want to go online order it order it and pick it up and not be bothered with talking to a human especially you know if they if they can do this at 2 a.m and pick it up the next morning for their breakfast they'll do it so they um it's really important to embrace that reality because that's not going anywhere that's here to stay and and it will only come more relevant um with time so I don't know about you, but I haven't been using cash at all. Um, 
I'm actually now in places that allow it. I'm using my phone that has my credit card in, you know, programmed in it. And um, I don't have to touch a terminal. So contactless payment is definitely going to continue. Um, and that's, again, you need, you need the technology. And if you have a store, you will need to have that technology. You can't go cash only. And you certainly uh, want to have the terminals that allow for this sort of, of payment. Otherwise, you're not going to be relevant. So now we're going to the trends that allow us to um, overcome a crisis. And in this instance, it's this crisis, but can be any crises. Um, and by that, you know, this is my fourth, um, what I call my fourth disaster. The, fourth, the first disaster was 9-11. Um, even though we live in the Hudson Valley, there were a lot of businesses that depend on New York City. And it affected a lot of small businesses that depended on New York City. So um, there was a ripple effect and many, you know, nobody could have predicted 9-11 um, and the effect it had in the local economy and yet it did. So there was that crisis. And then there was a 2008 um, real estate crisis that really affected different types of industries um, in the Hudson Valley and, and pretty much nationwide. And then we had the, um, the floods of Irene Lee and Sandy. And this was uh, localized um, and, and all of these crises were pretty much localized in terms of the time. You know, there was this beginning and an end and it was relatively short, a matter of weeks or months. But this is the first crisis that I'm um, dealing with with my clients that had a beginning, which pretty much March of last year. And we just didn't know how long it would last. We thought it was weeks, then it was months, and now we're looking at a couple of years. It's really long. So um, you can't really prepare entirely for this sort of crisis, but there are a few things you can do. If you bury your head in the sand, it's the problem's not going away. Um, I have a client now that literally that she didn't put her head in the sand entirely but she did it in the sense like oh i hope this doesn't last and i'm just gonna work my business to the best of my ability with the idea that um i'm gonna survive this but now that that's not enough right so she has to respond um so we're uh approaching um gently um, a transition so that she can be relevant and make more money and um, basically change her business model. So it's we're forced to change um, to these you know new circumstances. It's it's a basically a do or die. Um, and then there is we adapt. It's always painful to change. It's super important to change and we adapt and we recover um and you know we look at our business model is it relevant um is it serving the customers and their new needs um you know we really you really have to ask yourself some deep questions when you're looking to uh, make changes to continue to be relevant and the whole idea here is to not only survive, but to thrive. And there are businesses, and I'll give you some examples in a minute, that have uh, make cha made changes, they implemented very specific measures, and they thrive. So um, it is possible. It is the, it's not easy, but it is possible. Um, and then obviously what you want is you want a foundation. If, and if you have a good foundation with your business and your business model, you can um, basically, you can be prepared. Um, you, you know, nobody knows the impact of the crisis right now. Uh, honestly, we just can't predict exactly what it's gonna look like in a year or two. Um, but 
the, 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 we know for a fact that consumer behavior is changing. Business models um, are going to be updated and modified. And that, that all that becomes the building blocks for, for, for tomorrow. So we sort of have to know that the, what we're doing today will influence, you know, where our business and where our consumer trends are going to be next year and the year after that. So um, the SBA has identified a few business trends for 2021. Um, and they didn't say on that website where that came from in terms of their studies, but it's, and, and this will be a little bit redundant of some, th some things I saw in the past that we talked about earlier today, but um, of course, businesses will, will be online. And if you're not online and doing e-commerce, um, it's just not gonna work. Um, anything from selling cars to selling houses to uh, selling insurance, um, it's, you have to have a virtual presence. So as a result, <laughs> all the services that can be virtual um, because it's easy and convenient and safe uh, will be in high demand. Um, again, alternative uh, payment options will grow because e-commerce um, and, and touchless payment options will grow. And remote work will persist. And that's, that's for another year for sure. Um, Hopefully, you know, by 2022, we'll be back to normal, the new normal. Um, my daughter, who works in public health back in March last year, told me, oh, mom, we're, we're, we're in this for two years. And I thought, what does she know? She's 26 years old. She doesn't know anything. Well, she was right. We're in this for two years. So I uh, got to listen to the public health experts. All right. So what are some things that you, if you have a business model right now, that's what I would call anchored in the old normal before pandemic, you might want to think about how you can change it, right? Um, and if you have an existing business, definitely might need to update it. So what you want to do is you want to look, what are the, what are the trends going to be for the next year to five years? I'm saying year, one to five, because it's really hard to think beyond five years. Um, it's, there's so many things that can happen in five years, but one to five, one year for sure. We know what's what, what we're in it for the next year. We can pretty much predict that there are certain things that will stay. So how can you, um, align what you're doing and how you're doing it so that it aligns with any of the new, um, long-term trends that seem to be prevalent. So one of the things is you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? Um, for example, those um, car dealers that um, were basically told, you know, you can't bring anybody in the car <laughs> in the closed space and without social distancing, they basically said, well, we're still selling cars. So that's their existing capabilities, right? But how are we going to sell the cars now? So they basically would go um, and do a virtual tour of the car with the client. And the client would ask all kinds of questions. Well, show me the trunk. And they go, here's the trunk. And look at the trunk. You have this feature, this, that. And look at the, you know, the dashboard has all these features. They would go through a virtual, basically, meeting. Um, and then they would buy the car. So a lateral extension means that you're still selling your car. You're still showing it to consumers. But you're basically um, doing it differently and in ways you never thought it would be possible. Um, and basically, you need, it, need, it needs to make sense with your business model. You need to be able to make money, obviously. So, you know, you don't want to give those cars away um, or any service or any good that you might be selling. But you need to make, um, it has to be sustainable. So whatever change you're making in your business model it has to be sustainable. And this we can explore next week, um, next, next week, next, next meeting in a couple of weeks where we're going to do projections, which is my favorite um, because numbers talk. And what I do is show you how to make friends with numbers. 
and show you how numbers tell a story. And one of the things that I that that as a business owner you need to do if you need to make you know a real big change and pivot is um, to see okay with that change what how does that affect my bottom line? Uh, if I'm changing my or hours of operation um, and my clients are now coming you know digitally online and uh, I have you know, less or different employee hours. Um, how is that affecting my bottom line? Really, if you don't look at your numbers, you have no idea. So you have to understand the path, a sustainable path. So, um, all right. So we have some creative survivors. These are companies I heard about and some, these are not local, but I just wanted you to, to think about how, um, changes can be done. So this company um, was basically doing a lot of events. And what they decided to do because events were not possible is they basically um, changed basically their model to virtual. So they devised all these games that could be done in groups. Um, the, just a few days ago, they added um, a virtual escape room that you can work as a group trying to get out. Um, they just went virtual because, until they could have groups together. They got super creative because they thought this is, you know, we're, it's just not going to happen if we don't make it. We don't, it's just not going to happen. And I'm giving you this example of this company, which you'll have uh, in a PDF form and you can click on the link and go explore yourselves. But there are a lot of companies locally that um, depend on events and many have not done this sort of transition and are really suffering and are really hurting. And I think that um, learning from others is always a good idea. Others have, who have done it successfully can then um, show you the path basically. So that's how I look at it. Um, so the next one is, is, okay, so this hotel basically is a huge hotel. They're global. They're everywhere, all the largest cities. And they basically, everything went to a halt. So what they did is they um, created a staycation. So if you were in Berlin and you wanted to spend an overnight in the Mandarin Berlin, uh, they gave you this great discount, they would pamper you, and it was a way basically to keep their people employed, to get some income, and to keep the brand going. So um, they were, like I said, in all the major cities, and this was a way for them to stay um, basically relevant with, um, you know, the needs of their industry. So it's obviously that, you know, not everyone can do that, but definitely you can... Um, say, all right, so what can I do if you're in the hospitality industry um, to bring yeah, up somebody, oops, somebody needs to mute themselves. I don't know who it is, but somebody needs to mute themselves. Um, so this is just an example. And I was, I've spoken to um, you about the, 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 the car dealership. This is where all these ideas came from. Basically, you know, they went virtual, um, their sales, skyrocketed and they were like this is awesome we're never going back um chipotle we're all familiar with chipotle but the interesting thing with chipotle is that they want they basically uh were one of the first ones to say okay nobody's going to be dining in so we better change this model of ours and do a drive-through so they renovated their chipotle to have a drive-through um, they advertised the, the drive-through and they did not just survive, they thrived because they hired 8,000 new employees just like from the get-go to man, you know, those, um, those new windows. Um, and folks, you know, who at the time, restaurants had not woken up yet to the idea that they need to do, um, you know, curbside dining uh, for their clients. But Chipotle just jumped on it. So, you know, the faster, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I really like to look at leaders and say, what did they do better and different? And how can, you know, as a business, 
even little little business me uh, in little, you know, one horse down, how can I do things better? You can learn a lot from market leaders. Um, so another, you know, creative survivors, for example, this is um, basically a gallery that also sells jewelry. And obviously they had to close and they were like, wow, this sucks. Uh, what could we do? And they decided to create a show. So they have now a TV show every week that they, or every other week, I forget, but that is highly popular that they show how to, you know, what you can do with gems um, and how to source gems and how to make, how to, they, they show you how to make, how they make their jewelry. And people started ordering jewelry online, which they had never done before because it was a very um, high touch um, type of business. People like to go try, you know, the, the jewelry. So they had been in business for over like 80 years. And, you know, all of a sudden they were closed and had to rethink their whole business model. So there are ways to pivot to make things better. And that, you know, the idea of a show was something they wanted to do, but they were just too busy. And now they had the time to do it. So they turned really a problem into an opportunity. Uh, same thing with this company that the team building, um, they started offering these, these virtual team building and decided that, um, you know, we're going to create events that are going to be virtual um, since we can't now have them in real person. Um, so there are so many ways that you can think differently. And then there are some local companies that I wanted to tell you about. So these folks were doing basically um, trade show material, um, everything you needed for a trade show and exhibit. Well, we know what happened in March, all the trade shows were canceled and they were seeing their business really going under. So what they decided to do was transform um, their business and create dividers because now there was a high need for dividers. So they were for one of the first ones in the market locally to offer these dividers, you know, for restaurants, for cashiers, for all of that. So um, they still can do exhibit and trade show material for you, but they also, now they've expanded. If you go to their website, you're gonna see they've expanded all kinds of things that they can customize for your business. So that was a, a, a great pivot. And that's one of our uh, clients. And then, um, so, and then Surf Pro, because they, I don't know if anybody knows about Surf Pro, but I, I had a fire two years ago in my house and Surf Pro came the next day on a Sunday uh, to assess the damages. And what they do is they, they clean up after a fire or after, um, you know, um, flooding or anything like, you know, disasters like that, they come and clean up to make sure that um, there's no mold that develops in your house and so on and so forth. So um, great company. And they, um, they, their work basically um, halted um, when the pandemic um, shut down and shut them off. So what they did, they wanted to keep their employees. And, you know, like I was explaining earlier, human resource is, is really an asset in a business. It's really hard to find good people. It's really hard to train. It's really hard to retain. So for a lot of folks who found themselves in this predicament, um, there were some um, programs, and I'm not sure if Surf Pro received uh, a PPP, but if they did, um, this is one of the businesses that you know, even though they had no work for their employees, they kept them busy. And the way they kept them busy is that um, they decided to, um, to, to support first responders, fire, EMS, police. Um, so they disinfected for free over 800 first responder vehicles, including fire trucks, police vehicles, ambulances, uh, chief vehicles, and so on and so forth, including their gear. 
Um, so it was a way for them to give back to their community and to keep their employees busy. So thinking out of the box. Uh, Tittletown Spirits does, um, um, you know, uh, whiskey and bourbon and gin and things like that. And what they, because it was a shortage of um, sanitizing gel, they, um, within a week, were making sanitizing gel that they could sell by the gallon to those who needed it. So, you know, these companies basically decided to, again, there was a problem. They could see them as a source for a solution and they turned their business around with doing, you know, good for the community. So um, if you have uh, started your business plan, because, you know, last session we talked about um, how to make a business plan and you received the template. Um, so you may want to go back to your business plan and see if you identify any challenges between the model that you have in your mind and uh, trends that we face today and for a foreseeable future. So you wanna to look to see, is there anything different here? Um, and then if you identify these challenges, you see, okay, so what are the factors that influence each of these challenges? So you wanna just basic, basically make an assessment. And then you say, is this, just for a few months, or is this gonna last? And if it lasts, is my business prepared for it? And if it's just for a few months, is my business prepared for it also? So types of challenges, right? So um, you may want to think about how you're going to get new customers or reach your, you know, your, your, your existing customer base. Um, you just can't wait for them to knock on your door or to go visit your website. You have to be proactive. Um, if you don't have a web presence, get one. If you don't have a social media, get one. It's really important to have those in place. Do you need to expand your services in a way that you could never think before? So let's just say you want your hairdresser, right? Um, well, it's, it's, some people are still not comfortable going to a hairdresser. Um, so they basic, so then how, because, you know, it's an enclosed area and it's winter and you're right next to that person. So how can you make them feel safe? And, um, is there a way that you could, you know, can you make, can you make a mobile hairdressing facility where you go to people's homes with not homes, but I mean, their, their place of, of residence, but you operate out of your van that, you know, um, doors open, but there's a heater and there, so there's circulation of air, but you can do everything you need in that van. So here you go. You already, now you have a new service, which is, you go, you, you know, it's one-on-one -on -one and um, you can operate, you know, on your own time and, and hours and you don't have rent. So you want to think about how can you expand your offerings in ways that you may not be thinking about requires a lot of creativity. Um, it might be, you know, as easy as buying a competitor. So basically some folks now, I know for a fact, I have a few clients who are looking to focus on what they do best. Um, I have a guy who does uh, computer repairs and IT for companies. So he wants to just focus on IT and the computer repair from the consumer ends. He, he just rather would sell that. So he's he has a competitor that's going to buy that part of the business. And that competitor now is buying basically a whole list of clients, 10 years of service, you know, history that this company had. So it's a really um, fine way to, to overcome a challenge, which would be, you know, how to start a business right now. So look at opportunities. Um, when we're going to talk about projections next time. Um, big, big emphasis will be on budget, budgeting, of course, and uh, we'll probably only have time to do one scenario. But when you're looking at your budget, you really want to do three scenarios. The best case scenario, which I call the ceiling. Um, 
it's basically what's your ability, your maximum ability for income. So for example, to take a very simple example, and it's fresh in mind because I did it yesterday with my client, the gentleman that's doing OSHA training has a ceiling on how many hours you can train people in any given week. That's the ceiling. Then we did the, like, the most likely uh, scenario based on his experience. And then we did the worst case scenario in the sense that um, the bare minimum, what I call the floor, um, of what he needs to, to, you know, make this work. So, um, it's really important to, to navigate those, those scenarios so that you know what to expect. Um, revenue streams you may not even think about could be, um, could like, he's thinking now of getting this new certification so he can do virtual training as opposed to in-person training. And then he would be able to train folks from any any state. So we did not put that in the projections, um, but we just left the line item open, but it's will account for this new revenue stream um, in our next session when we'll have more time. But you have to think outside the box and say, what else can I, can I do? What type of income can I get? Um, new expenses. Can you think of PPEs, uh, cleaning supplies, um, faster internet, uh, better computer? There are so many different expenses that um, you may need to invest in that you need to think about. We're almost getting to the end here, so be patient. Um, and then we'll have a time, we'll have some time to talk a little bit. So um, as a business owner, you will need to build resilience. And how do you do that? And I'm talking about you as a person, not as a business, you as a person. Um, you have to really put yourself first because you're the business. Um, my dad had a line, you can be the wealthiest person in the universe, but if you don't have your health, you have nothing. So you have to put yourself first because you'll be thinking about your business when you wake up in the morning. You'll be thinking about your business uh, before you go to bed. You'll be thinking about your business on your days off. It will be forever present. So it's really uh, important to um, put yourself first. Very important to believe in your vision because if you don't believe in your vision, which could be something bigger than what you do now. Uh, I have a client who's starting a daycare and her goal is to have a, a center. Right now she's starting in their home with six kids and she'll grow to 12. And then and then her goal, her vision is to have uh, a daycare center. So the vision drives the day-to-day -day, uh, mundane tasks because um, that's just how it is. You need to have that vision. You want to be flexible because uh, things will happen, which are very, very different than what you thought they would be. So it's good to be uh, flexible and, and adapt. Um, you will make mistakes and that's how you learn. That's how you'll get better at whatever it is you're doing. I always say, if you don't know a trade, you know, get a job in that trade of that business you're looking to start. Um, and you'll learn on somebody else's dime rather than on your dime. Um, for example, a lot of folks think that uh, because they like shopping, they're going to love having a retail store. I have to tell you right now, it's two different things. They don't even compare. Okay. It's like two worlds. So go work in a retail store, similar to the one you're thinking of starting and see if you even like it. Um, it's super important to find time for yourself um, outside of your business. So that's a life skill. Um, if you're looking to be an entrepreneur for the rest of your life, which many do once they start, um, it's super important to be able to set boundaries uh, between your, your business and your personal life. And it's really hard, I have to be honest, but it's really important. Um, don't do it alone. Get help. You can get a business advisor. You can have a mentor or somebody else in the trade that's got years of experience that is looking 
to have uh, someone take over, you know, their business or their clientele or just, or they just want to teach them the ropes and, and help them out. Um, some people belong in groups of uh, business groups. It could be the, the Chamber of Commerce. It could, we have a really great group in the Hudson Valley called the Hudson Valley um, Women in Business um, group. And it's, there's like 2000 members of women in business. Um, they do now um, some mostly virtual weekly meetings in all in, in different cities, I think Beacon, Newburgh, New Paltz, uh, Kingston, Rhinebeck, I'm, I'm forgetting places, they're all over. Uh, really a great way to get support um, with other like-minded folks. So um, again, a little reminder of what we do. If you didn't have a chance to write the website earlier, you'll get these by the way as um, PDF, so you'll have those. Um, we have a survey that will be emailed to you. It's a, you click on the link, there's literally four questions. Please fill them out. There are a couple of reasons why it's important. We, we care about your feedback because that's how we make our trainings better. And actually three reasons. Uh, the second is our, our sponsors, the SBA require it. So we need to have those uh, in, in and know that you're real. And thirdly, um, you have space in there to ask, um, to put comments as to what type of trainings you would like. And these are going to be reviewed by us um, once these, these four sessions are done. And we might you know, continue um, past March, um, starting in April with new trainings and trainings that might be of interest to you. So that's why it would be great for you to uh, fill out that. So now in the part where um, we can talk, you know, if you have a business specific question about your business model that you'd like to ask, you can, um, you can ask, you put, can put your question in the chat or you can unmute and um, ask the question. Um, I don't even know if we, can we raise hands here? I don't know if we have that feature, but. Either way, um, we have, you know, another 10, 15 minutes where we can talk about more specific um, questions about your business model. Do you have any, anyone who might want to ask questions? This is a good time. Ah. Dina. Um, this is Toya. I just wanted to ask you, can you give us an example of a company's business model? A business model? Huh? You're asking a business model? Yes. Okay. So for example, I have um, a client who has, well, a business model would be, so they do retail, right? They do it's high touch. They sell bikes. People will want to try bikes. Um, they rent bikes and they repair bikes. So their model is basically about convenience in the sense that they want to make sure that when people bring their bikes, they can have them back quickly. Um, so now the way they adapted to the current situation is that they don't allow anybody in their shop. They changed the model. It's it, the, you, you ring a bell in their lot. They come outside, they keep their distance, and you explain the problem, they leave with your bike, and they do it on the spot. So what they did is rather than having being open seven days a week, they're only open four days a week. So, but they have the same labor hours in payroll. They're, they just have more people working at the same time so that they can see more people at, uh, you know, simultaneously. Does that make sense? It used to be like you drop your bike off and you pick it up the next day or two days later, or whenever they would be ready. But now, because they don't want, um, they want to minimize all this, all these transactions, they, they just ask you, wait in your car, we'll be right back. They fix the bike and they bring it back out. So it needed for them to have a lot of people 
working simultaneously. And since there's a ceiling to how much they can make, uh, given the amount of bikes that are around, the way they worked it out is they limited their hours. So it concentrates um, their visits. Does that answer your question? Yes, that was helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Hey, this is Digna. I don't know if you could hear me. Yes. But um, okay, so I am opening a pizzeria. I'm going to actually be operating if everything goes fine next week. But nice. I'm a little bit scared. I'm a little scared. The reason is because of the location and also for me, something new. I'm partnership with somebody. But I, you, you know, when you spoke about mentorship, how can I be able to reach out to people that already had the business, just wanted to know, have a feeling what works for them? I, I don't know. So how, what is your... Um, your advice for me to reach out to the people. Okay, so there's a couple of things. One is um, business owners are incredibly passionate about their business. So um, they love talking about their business. Okay, that it's, it's their, their heart and soul. So I would not go to the pizzeria within a mile of you Okay. <laughs> I would call a pizzeria in another state. All right. Basically oh. say, um, I'm calling from New York state. I'm a new business owner. Um, and you don't call it Friday at five o'clock, obviously. Okay. Just try to find a time that makes sense. Just say, would you be available to answer two or three questions? Don't give them your 20 questions. Save that. Say you might need to do five calls. You, but you pretend that that person is busy and will only have two or three questions that they'll want to answer before they move on back to their, to their business. And you, you might be able to find somebody that um, is very generous of their time and would be very hopeful, you know, willing to, to share a lot of information. But I would go with like, hey, um, I literally found you on the internet. I'm four states away, um, just looking to get a little feedback here. Or I saw your name in this article, if you do some Google search, like famous pizzerias or whatever, uh, you find an article, you find a pizzeria, you say, hey, I, I read this article about your pizzeria. I'm starting my pizzeria. I'm not, I'm not in California, I'm in New York, but would you, would you have five minutes to spend with me? So that, there's that. There are also, um, um, like I said, you know, if you're part of a chamber or if you're part of a, a, a the, this group I was talking about, the Hudson Valley Women in Business group, um, there's there's really a lot of support within those groups because every everybody's you know everybody's working hard to make it work, so we're all you know, they're all trying to help each other. Okay, then that's that, that's a good advice, the Chairman of Converse. I really wanted to, I really wanted to. I was thinking of you know trying to reach out, and the only thing that was keeping me like a little bit, um, you know, a little bit far is because just the location where I am, I am Hispanic and, right. and I just, you know, I don't know which or how, because if, especially I am a woman and Hispanic and many of the pizzerias places or, you know, or many of the businesses are run by a male. And, you know, it's so just for me, this is the first time. I hear you. So another thing is with the New York Small Business Development Center, we have, like I said, over 200 advisors. Many of those, like I said, one of the requirements to being an advisor is to have owned a business. Um, many, like I've helped possibly in my career, oh my God, maybe two, 300 restaurants, okay? And I'm not saying that all restaurants are the same and all issues are the same, but if you said, I want to talk to a Latino, Latina advisor that has experience with restaurants such as pizzeria, I, you know, we could put a feeler out and then you get matched with an advisor that can help you. Okay. So there's really, there's a lot of support out there. I just, I just a little bit scared and I have been reaching out. I have sent emails because, you know, the first time when I was trying to do a business plan because I'm trying, my son is helping me a lot because he graduated and he knows a little about business. So I've been, you know, depending on him, but I don't want to depend so much because I want to learn. 
So I've been reaching out. This is the first time for all of these months that I have been reaching out to a, a, a um, SBA uh, in Harlem. This is the first time that I receive an email saying that they, uh, you know, sending the application said they're willing to help. But I have been reaching out since December. So, you know, when al- almost everything was already set, what I was trying to navigate by my own, but um, I'm trying to reach them back and I wanted to see what they can offer. And there was like, you know, I was happy that I received that email. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, that answered my question. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, if you look at your chat, for those who were wondering about how to contact the Hudson Valley Women in Business, um, there's a link now right there. And if you don't have fa- Facebook, they have a website. So there's just, there's there's two Hudson Valley there's a Hudson Valley businesswoman <laughs> and the Hudson Valley woman in business, just to confuse you. Um, the businesswoman one is very much more local. I think it's it's just like Ulster, but this one is all Hudson Valley. Any other questions? Now is a good time. Don't be shy. How can I find a local attorney, CPA, or a company that provides business insurance? That I will answer as three questions. So um, for a CPA in your trade, sometimes asking friends, family that are in business locally is a good way to start. And, um, and I also highly recommend Chamber of Commerce because, um, you know, they would, yeah, Chamber of Commerce is usually a good place. And I, a lot of folks think that CPAs are not interested in small businesses. I have to be honest with you, it's 95% of their business, <laughs> especially in this area. They're all, in, all the businesses are small. So um, they will, they know, they know how to take care of small businesses. Um, for an attorney, attorneys have, have trades that are you know specific? So, do, are, you, are you looking for an attorney that understands real estate, or, or business contracts, or legal entities? So, attorneys really have more of a specialty. So, um, your CPA should know a few attorneys, and that can really be um, a good way to find an attorney. In terms of insurance, I always encourage my clients to find a. Um, a company that is more of a broker as opposed to an agent. And a broker will handle a lot of different um, insurances, whereas a, an agent will only have one. That's the distinctive difference. So a broker, um, if you're looking for um, liability insurance or um and, and, you know, benefits for employees, I'll talk later, but the liability insurance or product liability insurance or um, alcohol license, you know, license insurance, all that, you, you want to ask a broker because then they can pull um, questions, you know, to different companies and give you, comp- you know, c- compare basically price versus um, coverage and then you can decide. For benefits, um, there are companies that specialize in benefits for um, your employees. If you were to have employees and you wanted to have workers' comp, visibility, um, and other you know options, so these are much more um, you know specific to benefits. There are also payroll companies that uh, will take care of uh, workers' comp visibility for you. Um, and these, you know, there are multiple companies that do this in the area. Thank you. You're welcome. All questions are good. There's no, there's never a bad question. I've never seen a bad question. They're always good. Any other questions? Any comments, Elizabeth or Ellen? about anything I might have forgotten. 
I know this was a big topic, but yeah, <laughs> but you did good. I, I learned a lot. <laughs> No, thank you very much. I, I keep wondering though, too, as far as like resources, when you were talking about like chambers and uh, other networking resources, I wonder if that would be a good thing for us to have as well too. Um, I mean, I know it's pretty vast and we have maybe people from different areas, but um, I'm just trying to think of like a way to be able to make something that might seem a little daunting, a little more targeted to say, oh, if you're in this particular area, um, you know, this is, this is a good start. Uh, I'm just trying to think of, so let, let me think about that too. Yeah. Yep. I think we have another hand that's up. Um, Carlton. Yeah. So what uh, Ellen was just, uh, saying, um, something you said as well earlier just led me to, uh, acts or request, you know, is it possible to have like a business matchmaking session? Whereas, you know, you guys are dealing with businesses in the area all the time and you would have a good indication for what businesses might mesh well together or have some level of synergy, you know, via conversation or, you know, just even, I don't know, you know, seeing what's available. So, you know, is that something like that possible? So um, it's been something we've been at the SBDC we've been wanting to do for a long time. So there is a pilot program right now at one of the centers that they're actually doing that. They're, they're putting all of their clients like uh, with a portal that they can connect with each other. So um, once we know the outcome of that pilot program, then it might go statewide, which um, you can, if you sign up for our newsletter, I think you would get the um the news but um it's definitely something we want to do because there's so much value in having that kind of connection so much and especially this is taking again especially in, like you said resource it would be nice to have like a resource where to go like in you know like for fundings for um for guidance, for uh, change of cumbers and all of that. It would be great that we could be able to have at least a list so we could have an idea because I am navigated. But uh, sometimes I don't know which one is best or which one is fake. You know, we wanted to get something that is, you know, something that is, I could be able to trust and be able to call, not just somebody that is, you know, just there. Right. Um, honestly, I, you know, I don't want to be like, waving the SBDC flag all the time. <laughs> but I have to be honest, I, I was an advisor 15 years. I took a five-year hiatus to do other things and dabble into social responsibility and, and some social ventures and things like that, which was a lot of fun. And then came back because it's so good. Uh, and there are a lot of advisors who, for whatever reason, leave, come back um, because it's a great organization. And there's really a lot of, really a lot of wealth of, of experiences and of knowledge. Um, we're not volunteers, we're paid professionals. We, we do this, you know, full time. And um, if you have an advisor that you like, this advisor, I've been working for cli with clients for 10 years, some longer even. They come and go, they come and go, but they, you know, it, that person is there for you. So just mention, and, and we have access to resources. We can explain the funding process. If you missed last week's section, the last session, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, we have relationship with lenders. Not that it means that you'll get a preferential treatment, but what it means is that um, we can create an introduction. Um, we can also, you know, get you bank ready, you know, help you with your business plan, financial projections, all the exhibits you'll need to be prepared with a lender. Uh, the list goes on and on. So, um, thank you, thank you for that clarification because I thought you was a volunteer, and sometimes they don't call you back. And you know, sometimes it's a misconception that you have because sometimes some people are doing volunteer. I, like I said before, I've been trying to reach to them since December, and I haven't, you know, heard until today. And I was a little disappointed because I was, you know, in a rush to do certain things, and I needed guidance, and I just had to Google and kept calling them and sending emails. Nothing happened. So you'll so. be getting, everyone tonight will be getting an email from Chris that will have this presentation, the recording, 
the link to the survey and I'll include the link to the um, our website that has also, you know, um, you know, if you want to make an appointment. So that will be very easy. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You're very welcome. So next session is about numbers, projections. And if you have a fear of numbers, don't worry. We've all been there once. Uh, and I can help you with uh, making friends with numbers so that um, it's something you actually understand and want to want to work with. And that will make a lot of sense for your business. All right. Closing remarks, anyone? Are we good? No, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much for your information. It's very, actually, very good. Thank you. You're very welcome. So Karen was asking. Yeah, look, I noticed there were a couple more questions. Yeah, yeah. I just want to scroll back. Karen was asking, um, how are you matched with a counselor? Um, usually it's by geographic area, but um, like I said, if you know there's a specialty, sometimes we swap. I'll say, hey, I'm getting a client, and I, I know an advisor within my team that is a specialist in certain things. I might say, do you want this? Do you want to co-counsel with this person so that we can do this together? Um, and then if there are specific questions that, as it relates to a very specific trade, we can branch out statewide. So that's how it works. All right, thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention um, and your- thank you, um, thank you everyone that joined us this evening and thank you to uh, SBA and the city of Newburgh again and to Miriam for this excellent lecture. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, anyone. Have a good night, Have a everyone. Good Stay warm. <laughs> Be safe out there. Bye. -bye. <laughs>